The shooting of these young men became popularly known as the Breton Seven. These are their stories. The police, up until today, has no record of him. And they have no notation of him being involved in any wrong. He was not suspected of doing any wrong. So they couldn't have come for my kid. They are responsible, based on our investigation and intelligence, for many of the crimes happening in South St. Catherine. I proceeded low and tactically along the side of the house to the back of the premises, which was very dark with other police personnel. Superintendent Adams alerted the occupants of the premises and also knocked on a side window of the house. I heard commotion in the house and shortly after, explosions were heard coming from inside of the house, which quieted after a while. SSP Adams then shouted for the men to surrender and then several explosions were heard coming from the house again. I observed that the back door to the house was opened and I moved tactically towards the rear door along with Constable Bucknor, Constantine and Ebanks where we were greeted with gunfire. I saw flashes of light but could not see clearly as the house was in darkness. I crouched and returned the fire in the direction and saw a man fell at the doorway. We then went down a passageway. Constable Buckner and myself crawled on our bellies with Constable Ebanks and Constantine crouching behind. As we reached the living room area, I saw several flashes of light and heard loud explosions like gunshots. I returned the fire in the direction where the flashes were coming from. There was an exchange of gunfire and then the shooting quieted. After the shooting ceased, SSP Adams then joined us in the house with a big light and illuminated the room. I saw several men lying on the ground bleeding and suffering from what appears to be gunshot. There were six men inside the house and one at the doorway to the back door. The seven men were rushed to the Spanish Town Hospital by other policemen and I later learned they were all pronounced dead on arrival. Senior Superintendent Adams and Inspector C. McKenzie entered this premise along Sealway, which was also dark, with me and other police personnel. Constable Edwards, Bucknor, Constantine along with me, tactically placed ourselves at the end of the house on the premise. I heard a knock on the window where I heard Senior Superintendent Adams called out to the occupants of the house, telling them that the police are outside and that he had warrants to search and apprehend suspects in cases of murder and illegal possession of firearm. I then heard shuffling inside the house. Gunshots were heard subsequently coming from inside the house. I immediately took cover. After about one to two minutes, I heard Senior Superintendent Adams saying, put down your guns and come out of the house. The men again fired at us. The police simultaneously returned fire. I observed that the back door of the premise was opened. Constable Buckner, Edwards, and I crawled to the entrance of the house, which was dark. We were greeted with gunfire, where I saw sparks of fire and heard a loud explosion. Fearing for life, I immediately returned the fire where it was seen, for I was afraid of being shot and killed. Constable Bucknor and Edwards also fired in the direction of where the fire was seen. As we advanced in this house, we were greeted with more gunfire, where flashes of fire and loud explosions were heard and seen. The fire was returned in the direction where the sparks of fire were observed. Soon after, the place was calm. A party of policemen, along with Senior Superintendent Adams, entered a premises, and I, along with three and four officers, went to the side of the premises. I heard knocking on the metal window, then several explosions were heard coming from inside the building. Then I took cover by lying on the ground. Suddenly the back door flew open and I saw the movement of persons. I shouted, police, put light in the house and come outside. About three to four seconds I heard explosions and saw flashes of light coming from inside the house to the direction of the door where I was lying on the ground. I could not see the persons inside as the house was in total darkness. I then crawled on my belly along with Constable Edwards and entered the house while Constable Constantine and others cover us. As I entered the house through the open door, two men rushed towards me. I again shouted out to them, police, we are inside the house. I then heard another set of explosions and I fired several shots from my service rifle M16 56652325 in the direction that the shots were being fired and a man fell at the doorway beside a stone where I was. I got up along with Constable Edwards and several explosions were heard and I saw flashes of lights. I again fired my rifle in the direction of same. I heard explosions coming from beside me where Constable Edwards was. About three seconds later I heard several more explosions. After the shooting subsided, Mr. Adams entered the house with light and I saw a man lying face down beside a stone and a gun in his right hand. I took the gun from him, about a yard from him. Another man was lying beside a settee with another gun in his hand. I took it from him and identified them as revolvers. I then handed these revolvers to Detective Corporal McFarlane from the Spanish Town Criminal Investigation Branch. I saw Constable Edwards with two other revolvers in his hand. He told me that he took one from the hand of a man in the room and the other was found on the floor beside a bed. 
There is no doubt that the CME was established in good faith to rid the streets of gangs and gunmen that threatened the lives of innocent Jamaican citizens. After the statements were made by these officers who were acquitted of all charges, all seemed to be well, until the statements were compared to actual evidence. That was when things seemed way off. Linroy Edwards, who was a corporal at the time, claimed in his statement that the seven were rushed to the hospital where they were pronounced dead. But how can that be, when six of the boys were shot in the head up to six times, at very close range, there is no way these boys could have been alive when they left that house. The amount of gunshots the officers claimed to have been fired at them, along with the occasional explosion, described a shootout fit for a world war. Just how many bombs were recovered from the house? Things were just not adding up if the police came under such heavy gunfire multiple times. Why wasn't the crime scene backing up their claims? A police firearms expert testified that the weapons reportedly recovered from the house had fired a total of 11 shots. Other forensic and tactical firearms experts who have reviewed the evidence have been strongly of the opinion that the Breton 7 were executed by the police and not killed in a shootout. Other claims just didn't make any sense. Some statements claimed that the back door was already opened, and other statements said that the back door was flung open. So which was it? This entire walkway was surrounded by police, so why are there no mention of the men they claimed escaped? The police officers claimed they feared for their lives, but at the same time described getting up and confronting the men in a dark house where there are explosions and an active shootout. Which was it? If a shootout happened in the dark, and the boys were rushed to the Spanish town hospital immediately after they were discovered. Why did the autopsy say that shots appeared to have been deliberately aimed at the heads of Lansbert Clark, Curtis Smith, Dane White, Tamayo Wilson and Andre Virgo at very close range? I personally made initial observations on those injured persons. Based on my training, I came to the conclusion that all might have been unconscious. See Part 3.